back here and uh, this time to bring my son Andrew. Uh, we've just gotten back from a fly fishing and horseback trip in Colorado, so it was nice that it all worked, all worked on this. Um, when the Sri Lanka conflict was occurring, uh, Channel 4 in London had uh, received a series of videos of the conflict, and quite graphic uh, videos. Uh, they didn't know where they received it, they just arrived in the mail. Uh, they didn't know when it, the videos were taken, where they were exactly taken, uh, who took them. Uh, they had a program to, to uh, uh, show as much as they could on this and talked about the conflict that was occurring. Uh, and the next day, they sent out a note uh, through Channel 4 saying, if anyone had any information about exactly when and where these videos were taken, we'd like to know. The Sri Lanka government came out that next day saying, well, these are just fake. Uh, that was before it, it, fake news was used so, so <laughs> frequently here. Um, and so they countered by saying, there's nothing you can do. You can't, it's not been authenticated, can't happen. So that was the idea. So well, what happens if we could create through technology the ability to have all of that information to where you would be able to counter any suggestion that this was fake, and more importantly, could you create something that would allow that video or the pictures to speak for themselves in a court of law? Because all of us know, of the, and we've talked about this over the last, uh, last two days, the, the type of, of information that's out there, but it's quite crowded and you don't know whether any of it's authenticated. So um, this is a process, program that we, we, we started putting together and I'm, I was uh, very much... Um, I uh, wanted to thank Michael Scharf, too, because it was with Michael that we kind of first launched this several years ago, but it was also looking and bringing together a number of uh, individuals to try to design this. Richard Goldstone has been key on this. Uh, Stephen Rapp, too. We talked to him earlier in the, in the, in the process as, as well. Paul Williams. So it's really been, been quite good. So what I'm going to do is show you a quick little video, and then I'm going to speak about some of the, the, the aspects of this. Let's see if this works. Here at Eyewitness, we know that the most heinous crimes would never have been brought to justice without brave eyewitnesses. And that with the smartphone, many more individuals have been able to raise red flags around the world, exposing crimes that may never have surfaced. We also understand the barriers eyewitnesses face in verifying the truth of their evidence. Views can be biased. Footage can be edited. As an initiative of the International Bar Association, we know the legal requirements for photos and videos to be admitted as evidence in court. Recognizing the immense risks eyewitnesses take, we believe these efforts should never be in vain, and potential evidence should always be admissible in a court of law. Our mission is to facilitate justice for the worst international crimes. That is why we've developed the Eyewitness to Atrocities app, for eyewitnesses to easily gather footage about atrocity crimes that can be verified and assessed by professionals for legal use. When using the app, the date and location are collected from three separate sources, before internal software creates a digital fingerprint for the footage, rendering it uneditable. Most importantly, we ensure a trusted chain of custody and act as verifiers once the footage is sent to us. And that's not all. Our partnerships with LexisNexis, DLA Piper and international law firms make sure that all footage is secure from hacking and analysed by a network of top lawyers for use in investigations or trials. Although atrocities are inevitable, justice is not. It requires evidence. With the Eyewitness to Atrocities app, courageous eyewitnesses to these crimes are empowered to capture the evidence needed to hold the perpetrators accountable, to seek justice for the worst international crimes. So 
So part of this, I'm going to just go through a little bit, and this is the, the app that's on this phone that I'll refer to in, uh, in, in a few minutes. So part of this is that we've talked about the difficulties, particularly those who are in conflict arenas that are really taking a personal uh, kind of gamble with their lives to, to, to take photos. And we know there's millions of them now on YouTube and photos, uh, videos. Um, but of course, the problem is, is authenticating them. How, how can you use these uh, to bring to justice those that have, have committed? And you need to authenticate uh, the, 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 the information that's being filmed. And so the eyewitness app really empowers individuals now to know that when they are taking uh, videos, that the information that's being gathered can in fact be used in a court of law. And this is really increasing kind of the credibility of being able to, uh, to, to use that. Every time a photo is, and, and w w one thing we have to talk about is kind of the pillar. So we've designed these in a way that captures the information in a way that a court of law can, uh, can use that. And the, the, the most important thing for us right now is the fact that, that the information is brought in, it's, it's all encrypted into the phone that's once it's used. And so the user doesn't have to concern him or herself about deciding when it, where, where it was, where, where the photos were taken, the videos were taken. It's already been, uh, it's already been done that. What we went ahead and when we started designing was to go to a, to a series of experts. We went to all of the tribunals and sat down. This took about two years to design. We looked at all the experts. We wanted to know what was needed in order for the pictures and the photos to be able to be uh, submitted on its own, to allow them to speak, to allow the videos to speak for, uh, for themselves. And so we, 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 we just went through and tried to design that and made sure that we have ticked those boxes uh, on that. And that's how we then went with a group of, of experts to, uh, to design the, the actual app it, itself, ensuring that we have that. And the most important thing, this was discussed uh, this morning as well, is being able to have this viable date and location. And so the app captures this automatically. It captures it through the GPS, um, through Wi-Fi, uh, and, and cell towers as well. So there's three areas where you can capture this information. The GPS is the most powerful of those, but even without that, you can capture it uh, with the other ones. So all of that is in there, uh, and it's embedded into the, into the, app, uh, uh, into the app itself. Now this becomes an important part of that. Uh, how do you ensure that the information that's being gathered is, the, is, is accurate and has not been in any way altered? And that's crucial. So the app is designed so where it, gen it generates a, a particular hash code, and that hash code is based on a pixel account for each of the photos or the videos that are being taken. All of that information is encrypted into the phone, and so you can't alter that. But if there is any attempt to alter it, when it goes into the, when it's transferred into the eyewitness uh, evidence box, if you will, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it verifies whether or not, through an al algorithm, whether or not there's been any attempt to alter the videos or the pictures. And it can tell immediately through this algorithm in the, in the in the pixel account, the hash value, whether that's happened. If it has happened, it won't accept it. It won't accept the information that's coming from the, uh, from the app. So it kind of determines and it ensures that you've got an unedited version of the information that's coming from the phone into the, into it, uh, uh, into the eyewitness um, uh, vault. The vault actually is, we had to figure out, well, how do, we, how do we create a vault that the information can go to? And we went to LexisNexis. LexisNexis is, is in the United States, the holder of, of most of the secure information from companies, from governments. It's really the, the gold standard. And they agreed to, to design this for us. Security was absolutely paramount. This also 
kind of was discussed this, uh, this morning. We know that individuals using this app, or there's a personal risk to that. And so we've designed it to where, one, when you take this, when you take the, 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 the pictures of videos, you're taking it in the eyewitness app. And once you open that eyewitness app, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking videos now of all of you, uh, <laughs> that once I close it, that information is stored not in your camera, not in your, your gallery. It's stored behind that in the eyewitness app gallery. Now, the only way I can get into that is I have a code that you, you've created when you've downloaded it. And I put that code, and that code brings me into that. If somebody were to say, I want you to open up your, your gallery, um, if you put a fake code in there, it moves to the public gallery. The only way it moves to the eyewitness app gallery is with your code. So it's very general. You're not trying to hide anything. You would just put your unit code there, and it moves over to your public gallery. And, of course, the camera, the videos and, and uh, pictures are not in the public gallery. They're behind that. The other thing is we, we noticed at the beginning when we launched this, we felt, well, we wanted to have an opportunity so the eyewitness icon uh, could become known. We allow the user to put any icon he or she wants there. And so that was a big, big part of it. The other part of it is you can delete with the two clicks, you can delete any pictures or videos you've done. With two clicks, you can delete all of the pictures and videos in the gallery, the eyewitness gallery. And with three clicks, you can delete the entire app. So that to us was important as well. So in case you're in a, in case the user in a situation where people are targeting or are beginning to ask, what exactly do you have on that phone? You're able to quickly uh, uh, get rid of it if that's what you wanted to. If that's what you want to do on that, um, the safeguarding and the chain of custody. That was what we were talked about earlier. And of course, I've mentioned then the encrypted nature of this information with all of the metadata that's attached to it. So the chain of custody really does not become relevant any longer because the picture and the video speaks for itself because all of that information is, is embedded uh, in, into, uh, into the app. That is moved over again to this virtual locker um, and when somebody is sending in a video or picture, they, it first must go to the eyewitness uh, storage. Why? Because it's only then that you can ensure that the, the pictures and videos have not been altered in any way. But once that's sent in, you have the ability to send it to social media or everywhere, anywhere else you want to send it to. But the initial one goes to the, what we call the evidence locker uh, uh, on that. Now, the, the, the third one, and this too was talked about this morning, is fascinating because you have all of this inf the, the videos and pictures coming in. We've had now, I think, over 8,000 in the, in, the, in the evidence box in the last two years. But there's a need to review and catalog and tag this because you can't just dump this to the International Criminal Court or some tribunal. It becomes useless for that. So instead, we every week we have a, seri we have a group of, of international lawyers that come and they review the videos and pictures and they tag those videos and they put those into dossiers. So the dossiers then are much more narrowed, and so if a court was interested on a particular day in a particular conflict, we're able to now to say, well, this is what we have. So you're not looking at everything that's been taken in that, uh, in that conflict. And so that's been a really important part of the, of the eyewitness project, is having this type of assistance in being able to advocate for these films on that. That's not coming up, unfortunately, but the, if it did come up, no, do I have to hit again? Yeah, Bless you. Thank you, Jim. So there it was, 2016 submissions on that, 2017, 2018. So the submissions are really moving up, and that would be expected as the eyewitness app becomes, uh, becomes uh, something that's used more frequently as well. We also do a great deal of work with NGOs in conflict environments as well, not just individuals. Anyone can download it, but we also work strategically with NGOs. Uh, so the partnerships, you'll see where we have it right now uh, and pretty well across the world. 
uh, and these are partnerships, n not individuals that download them, but we will be asked by NGOs or asked by entities if we could create a partnership with them so that we can, they can use the eyewitness app and they're better informed about it. So that, the partnership part of this program has really grown steadily. When, I, when we first thought about this, we felt it was going to be primarily individual users, but what we're finding is that there's real need and interest in partnerships. This gets back to one of the questions that Brenda had asked about NGOs and, um, and, and the, their involvement, and this is a big part of that. So we've had uh, 13 dossiers submitted so far. Uh, these are where we've We've submitted them. Um, a number of them have come to us uh, asking if you have any information about this. And so we've created these dossiers, and now they have been submitted to these uh, entities. Uh, the first trial that was submitted was in the DRC, and this happened in 2012 uh, with uh, several uh, militia leaders. And the eyewitness app uh, evidence was used in that trial. Uh, and uh, those, uh, uh, those individuals were found guilty of massacre, the leaders. So, so that was our first uh, real test uh, in the use of the court, and it worked, uh, it worked quite smoothly on this. So looking at technology, we think this is a bit of a game changer. Um, uh, we, we feel confident so far that we've, uh, how we've experimented uh, with it, uh, that it, it does work in, in the court of law. We're always testing it. We're making sure that it stands up to any scrutiny. Uh, it, we're, it's, it's relatively new, uh, but the growth of the videos and, and pictures that are coming in uh, to us suggests that it's something that uh, is not only wanted but needed. And again, this suggested the same conversation we had this, uh, this morning as well. So I'm going to stop there and then open it up if you have, have some, uh, some questions or comments or anything. Yeah? So I know I've been following this for a couple of years. Excellent. And so I know that there was some challenging related to audio because phones treat audio differently than video files in terms of where they can put that. Have you guys been looking about how you can set it up so someone can just record Yes. Video? So when you, when you download the app uh, on this, uh, there is a, uh, there, there is a, uh, a, an ability, uh, four, six, five, one, two, three. <laughs> Okay, good. Thank God. Um, there, there, is that the fake one or not the fake one? Huh, and, and, and I'm sorry to say, for me, it's the, it's the public gallery. I, I'm now forgetting my, my code on this. But it, what it does, it does, so that works. Um, what it does is it allows you to toggle between uh, the uh, uh, video or recording or single frames. The, because, we, because all of this is encrypted, we tend to put, and when, we, when, when, when you download it, you said it tends to be a 10-minute uh, length for videos because anything beyond that becomes much more difficult when you're encrypting that information and sending it through. But the audio is now on there, and people can use just the audio as well on that. Layla? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a great question, uh, Leila. First, couple of things on that. When you down, when somebody downloads it, we don't know who you are. You can give us your information if you'd like, because later on the the, the prosecutor might want to reach out. But you don't have to. We don't collect any information that's personal. To you. We don't even collect information about the phone. So that's. I wanted to clarify that. That's completely uh, set. There is an agreement when you download it. You, it's a standard agreement that says that says the information that's being sent to to the eyewitness evidence becomes we we become we can control that. Once it's sent to us, you can again send it to anywhere you want to send it. You can use it for your own purposes uh, in advocating for justice through another channel. But we get it first, and I say we get it because we need to make sure, we need to verify the authenticity of it by this pixel account on that. Now, interesting in, in our partnership arrangements, those are much more in-depth. Some partners say we, we want to have first use of this, not the, I, not the IBA in that sense, and we, 
we accept that. Our point is, is to make sure we're just trying to use the technology to bring to account those. So it's quite flexible on that. Yeah. Just a question about um, collaboration with the broader technology sector and, and bigger companies. And I'm curious to know um, what kind of partnerships you're exploring or, or kind of collaboration. I, I just tried to go to the Apple store and download the Yeah. You can't do it in the Apple. Why is why is that? Why is why is that? Why is that? Why is that? It's a fascinating question on this one. Why? And we had to deal with this at the beginning. It's not because, surprising, not surprising, maybe not surprisingly, in the areas that the, kind of the, what you refer to as potent, conflict or potential conflict there, Androids is 90% of your market. 90, over 90% of the market. Apple doesn't. So that's one. Two, Apple, at least up to this point, has been much more restrictive in requiring, um, uh, requiring information from us that we're not comfortable with because we're fearful of what that might do for the users. For instance, the ability to, to capture, the, to find out who the individuals are who've downloaded it. But we're still in discussions and we, we hope that we will get over those hurdles at, one, at, at, at some time in the future, but it's not necessary for us right now. The Android is what we made the decision on, and that was the right decision on that. Yeah, Jennifer. Mark, this is terrific. Whether um, your efforts to promulgate knowledge of this uh, globally to potential users. Well, I, you know, it's it, like anything, like, like any new technology, new program, the, the, the getting it up and running and finances and staff. So we now have a staff of five full-time people right now, which is a big jump for us. So we're constantly, constantly trying to get this out in, 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 in not, you know, to get people aware of it. Um, and the, the staff, I think, spends a lot of time on that. So part of it is speaking at these types of events. Uh, I don't do much anymore on it uh, because we've got a, a director and Wendy Betts and she does and her staff does it. So. Um, but th this is a lot of what we do. TED Talks, they've done that. So it's a constant push. But I was, I am surprised, that, and, and by the way, it's people, I, I, uh, Stephen Rapp has always talked about this and he's written about it, so these types of things are very important for us when people become aware of it and talk about it, particularly in this type of community. It's, a, it's big. Having Justice Goldstone part of the uh, Board of Trustees that from the start, that was really important. So it's a constant any suggestions will be, will be asked. Navi? Um, I'm interested in whether each time you introduce the business portal, you have to call an expert to explain the cost exactly to be on yes. Yes. Now we're still we're still new in this. As I say, last year was the first time uh, we've created these. I think I said 13 dossiers that are in front of courts or committee commissions right now. But that tr trial was the first one that went, and that we did have to. We provided an affidavit from our our IT people as to how it was designed, what's done. So we did explain that to them, and they accepted that. So that. We always expected that that would be something that would be required, but we have no issues with that at all on that. Most importantly, though, we, even in that situation, the individuals who took the videos that helped convict were not called as witnesses. They, were not, they didn't want to, and that's part of the issue here, that this allows people to, to, to participate in ensuring people, the, the atrocities are being brought to account without necessarily having to put their lives at risk of appearing in front of a court. They didn't have to do it. Yeah. In 2.5, especially of the design, and, and very and kind of to the, uh, the evidence that it has to be originate from the app, is that correct? That's a great question. If you, if you try to, if you try to, if you're just, if I'm in the public, if I'm in, your phone, in the yeah. regular phone and I take a picture of, of, of whatever, and I send that in to, uh, to our, our, it won't, it won't go in, it won't go in. It only, it will only accept the videos coming from the app and being taken through the app. So that when I'm taking that, 
when I've opened the app and I'm taking that video, that information is now being collected and it's encrypted, and that's what we'll accept, accept to, the, uh, to, to our, our server, if you will, our evidence box. So if I may follow up, that yeah. It is. On the part of the user, it, an it, almost rehearsal. It's, it's interesting because we, as with versions, this is a, I think this is, we're probably at a 2.1 version on this, maybe, I think. And that was a, our first version we felt was a bit more complicated in, in, in trying to educate people on what, what happens. This is really has simplified things. All you have to do is you have to make sure that you're in, you press that button, the eyewitness button here, and you're automatically into our app on that. You're taking pictures of it, and once those pictures or videos are taken, you, you, the only way you can, only way anyone can see it is to give your PIN number, then you're going back into that gallery. By that time, that's all encrypted. Uh, when, when you send the videos in, it can be, you can, on the app, you can say it could be done automatically or done at your time. You can do it either way. Once it goes into our, uh, in our evidence box, it tells you that it's been received and that it's received. If you want to come, you can put notes on it. You can put notes, you can put write things. If you want to add anything on there, that's fine. That also will come through. If you want to come back to the video that you already sent in with additional thought, you said, oh, hold it, I think I remembered it was so-and-so in that video, you can do it. The, 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 the app or the, the, the uh, uh, evidence locker will recognize that it's the same picture coming in, and it will update it automatically. So that's been that's another thing, Michelle. No, you already answered. Okay. That. So about instantaneous, um, yes, you can. You have your choice. Yeah. You can do it, or you can say no. I'll do it at a time when I feel more comfortable with it. It's up to you. Can you set it to delete automatically after it goes? I know they talked about that in an earlier version of once it gets. You can. You can. Our concern was primarily from the users initially, we were fairly dogmatic to say we, we need this information to come to us in order to authenticate it. But I think we needed to be more flexible, allowing the user then to send it to YouTube. That's what this does now. It, it, as, long as, you, as long as it's sent to us first, then you, what you do with it is up to you. You won't be able to, you, you won't be able to get past the authenticity part of this, you only be able to do that when, you're, when you've got the, uh, what, the app. The video that we get in the, in the, uh, uh, the back of LexisNexis, we, we, we take a, a copy is made for us. That's the copy that's used by the international lawyers who come in. They come in every week, actually, um, and they look at it, and it's the copy. The original stays in that vault until it's requested uh, by the court on that. Yes? Yeah, you touched on it, so I'm interested to understand more the strategy behind the quote-unquote uh, uh, ideal user approach. Yep. You mentioned the NGO, yep. the partnerships with the staff with the NGOs, and even if going further, like how would they get, if this eventually would be put in the hands of people on the ground, people living on the ground, like how would they get access to the smartphones to use this app? Um, so can you speak more about that strategy? The strategy, the strategy is three prongs. One is individuals. Anyone can, anywhere can download it, and, and individuals oftentimes do, and they can, they can interact with, with sending in the pictures and videos, and out of the 8,000, number of the individuals have. The second prong, though, is working with NGOs on ground. That was really a bit of a game changer for us, because they wanted to have something that they were certain that if they're putting themselves in, in line of fire, uh, lack of a better term, that the information being used would, would be accepted in a court of law. That we deal with individually. We have an arrangement with them. We will train. We will do whatever we, whatever is needed uh, on, on that. Yeah, they, we provide, we, we have a training program that tries to provide them kind of best practice. When you download the app, it gives you lots of information about suggested ways of, of using it, the security part of that. But some of the NGOs, we've had to create a special ID 
so that when they send that in, we know it's from that NGO because some of the arrangements we have, and it's not just with NGOs actually, um, they have asked that they have first, the first opportunity to use it in their own investigations or their own prosecutions, and we accept that because we say, well, whether we do it or you do it is fine, we're just providing a tool. But we will advocate, we are advocating for that videos and film, the, the videos and pictures coming in, that's what those lawyers do every week in tagging and, and putting together these dossiers. Because we want to be able to say, hold it, we think we have information here that is relevant. So we will be proactive and head towards whatever that regional court, international court, as well as they can come to us. Yes, and I've forgotten that. <laughs> but in terms of the lawyers tagging, it sounds like the system is entirely manual right now. The tagging of the footage. Yes, it is. It's well, it not the tagging, everything is everything is is embedded, all that information, but you are right. We we felt that we needed in order to put together uh, if you've got a if you've got a, a, a thousand pictures and videos of a particular incident, um, what, what they do is to track things and try to identify not a thousand but 500 or even less than that and so they'll put them in different categories so that when when it, they're being when we're being asked about that it's already been done for you can't dump a thousand of these videos to a prosecutor they won't you know that's not what they're interested in. no that's not what they want because a lot of it a lot of it and by the way something that you, that is if you download the app and, and you want to use it, and I want to take shots of Michael Sharp playing music, I could do that. That's a war crime. Well, it could be. <laughs> and, and, then, um, and then he, then Michael, or somebody's taken it of Michael and decides to send it into our, our, our evidence locker. The question is, would it be accepted? And the answer is, yes, it would be accepted. But now we've got to look at it and say, is that something we're, we're, we're thrilled to have Michael's music, but that's really not going to help us much. So that's part of what the review every week is, is uh, as well. Um, oh, where? One more. Right oh. Navi had a question. Oh, Navi. Maybe. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, it is your second turn, but you, do, you who do have stature. Obviously, I'm still obsessed with the court. Good. The rules do allow for it, and they allow for it in uh, at the, at the ICC. They allow for it at every regional court we've dealt with so far, and national courts as well, as was done. You know, it's not, it, it, it's not to say their arguments won't be made. Of course, their arguments will be made. But, but the point is, if you, can, if you can ensure and show that the information that has been provided uh, is accurate, it's not been in any way altered, uh, it portrays exactly what is being filmed, then it becomes relevant. And it's, re excuse me, then it and it's relevant to the case itself, then it's admitted. And, and, that, that, and that's what we had to do at the start. We had to really start at the beginning and say, what do we need in the app? And how, can the, how does the app work in a way that allows a court to say, we accept it? That's what we did from the start. And again, that took a long time. But that's exact. We needed that first, and then we went out and designed it. That's that's what it is on that. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'm appreciative of, of your thinking on that. Thank you.